Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always, ladies and gentlemen, his real name is Guy Man Dude, but I call him the Captain. What's happening? It's good to be seen and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Psychokinesis by the bright and brilliant minds over at Grim Artisan Ales. Garage grade, let's go with three and three quarter bottle caps out of five. I love Grim Ales and they make so many great beers, it was hard to choose one. So expect to see them featured again. But this week it is Psychokinesis, which is a dry hopped and tart wild ale with notes of tropical fruits. And this week's beer was brought to the garage by these bright and brilliant minds. First up, we have Kimberly in Phoenix, Arizona. And a big shout out to Paul in New Orleans. Let's go to the great state of Texas and say hello to Natalie in San Antonio. Hello. da. And then here's a cheers to Mila in Wilmington, North Carolina. And a big we like your jib to Aaron from Windsor, Colorado. And last but not least, a shout out to Sarah, New Paltz, New York. So thanks to everybody for filling up the fridge for this week's show. If you want to help us out with next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com. Click on the donate button. While you're there, check out our blog. You can click on the different cases. There's discussions going on on there. There's a lot of the great listeners providing some great theories and information on these cases as well. And make sure you check out the store page this week. We have two new logo shirts that are going to be in the store this week. And that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. This is a true story about absolute madness and how a paranoid schizophrenic serial bomber used gunpowder and homemade explosives to bring chaos and fear to New York. The following is an excerpt from the book Incendiary by Michael Connell. The NYPD certainly didn't understand it. The famously tough-minded New York detectives stumbled and fumbled as a harassing band of newspaper reporters detailed at every turn. For more than a century, the police had relied on muscle and shoe leather to collar bad guys. The street corner respected the billy club, and that was that. But reliable strong-arm methods proved useless in the face of a schizophrenic serial bomber. Seldom in the history of New York, wrote the Associated Press, has a case proved such torment to police. The bomber's rampage came at a time when science was transforming the way Americans thought about the world around them. Jonas Salk came up with the polio vaccine, eradicating a disease that crippled hundreds of thousands. Bell Labs paved the way for modern electronics and all that came with it by inventing the silicon transistor. Physicist Edward Teller created the hydrogen bomb. Scientific advancements, however, did not elevate policing, at least not in New York. The NYPD's corrupt precinct captains and stubborn commanders resisted new methods promoted by college-educated criminologists until a serial bomber forced them to adapt.
On September 5th, 1931, a 27-year-old mechanic is working at a consolidated Edison generating plant in New York City. While this man is going about his business, a large boiler near him misses ignition. Fumes start to collect, building and building, and then ignition occurs, followed by a sudden explosion. The blast lifts the young man and throws him to the floor. There is a large discharge, and a black cloud shoots from the boiler, releasing a dark fog of hot gases. The man is unable to get up. He lies there helplessly, surrounded by the heat and the gases as the black cloud consumes him. The hot gases and fumes begin to fill his lungs, choking him. Not only can he not breathe, but his lungs and throat feel as though if they are on fire. Lit from within, the flames growing, the heat rising, and the pain is unbearable. The man thought surely the blast has killed him, and now he is burning in hell. Finally, the young man comes to, and he sees what he thinks to be angels cutting through the fog and coming to his aid. The man was rushed to the hospital, and though he was severely injured, he would survive and recover, although not completely, because the accident left him disabled. And after collecting 26 weeks of sick pay, the man was fired from his job because he was no longer physically able to perform his job duties. The accident had led to pneumonia that in turn developed into tuberculosis. He filed a worker's compensation claim, but it was denied because he waited too long to file it. He appealed the denial of the compensation three times, but each time it was rejected. Nine years later, on November 16th, 1940, a worker at the Consolidated Edison Power Plant located at 170 Street Number on the busy West 64th Street in Manhattan found a wooden toolbox sitting unattended on a windowsill. Thinking someone had forgotten their tools, the worker decided to inspect the wooden toolbox. Inside, there were no tools. But what was found caused the worker to panic and the NYPD were notified. The item and the toolbox were successfully located and removed and no one was hurt. The police had found what was described as a crude pipe bomb. It was a short length of brass pipe filled with gunpowder with an ignition mechanism made of sugar and flashlight batteries. It was a dud. It never exploded. The bomb was wrapped in a note written in a distinctive block lettering. The note stating, Con Edison Crooks, this is for you. And it was signed F period P period. Well, this first bomb is kind of interesting because it's wrapped in a note. So a lot of people believe that this bomb was meant to be a dud because why would you wrap it in a note that you want people to read and have the bomb blow up and then destroy the note? Yeah, that's the investigators looking into the matter. That was their thought, you know, because the note would have been obliterated by the explosion, Uh, bringing up the obvious possibility that the intention of the bomb and its maker was to threaten someone or maybe even everyone at this Con Edison location, not actually to injure or kill. Right. Had the intent been to injure or kill, the maker would have made sure the bomb would have exploded and then sent a letter later claiming responsibility for this action. In September of 1941, a pipe bomb was found lying in the street near Four Irving Place. Uh, this is in New York City. There were no casualties in this event either. The bomb had been dropped without the fuse being lit. The bomb... It had similar construction to the one found at Con Edison in November. And this was found inside of an old sock. There was no note with this bomb, however. Yeah, it was a wool sock. And police theorized that the bomber might have spotted a police officer or for some reason got scared and dropped the bomb out of fear without setting its fuse. Uh, If this were true, it is likely that the bomb was not dropped near its intended target now here's an interesting thing captain the bombs they did scare some of the consolidated edison employees and some of the people who would walk and travel near irving place right but there were much more scarier events going on around the world world war ii was well underway and many countries 
joining forces with others, taking sides in the loss of life due to war would never be greater. In December of 1941, Japan attacked the United States and European colonies in the Pacific Ocean. The United States joined the war, and shortly after, the police received a letter. The source cited here says the letter was all in block capital letters. Now, I've seen photos of this letter, and it actually appears to me to be letters cut from possibly newspapers and or magazines. Yeah, this is the stereotypical you know, serial killer, serial bomber, you know, clipping uh, letters that they, that you'd see in all the old time uh, movies. Yeah. And regardless of how this letter was constructed, it, it read as follows. I will make no more bomb units for the duration of the war. My patriotic feelings have made me decide this. Later, I will bring the Con Edison to justice. They will pay for their dastardly deeds. Signed FP. Hmm. So he, so we have one bomb planted, one bomb accidentally planted, neither bomb go off. And then we get a letter because this guy's so patriotic that he's just not going to bomb during the war, during the course of the war. Yeah. And true to his words, uh, true to the bombers words, there were no bombs that showed up during the course of the war. And in fact, for five years after that, was it? Well, yeah, but it's also a long war. I wonder, I wonder if every year the guy just kind of sat around going, "Damn war, still going on." Well, instead, can't start my bombing until the war's over. He didn't stay silent because instead he sent crank letters, threatening letters, and postcards to uh, police stations, newspapers, movie theaters, to private citizens, and to the Consolidated Edison Power Company. All signed from this FP. Yeah, but uh, I mean, at at that point, what this is not much of a threat. Well, we will never know the grand total number of of the amount of correspondence that FP sent and where they all went. But what has been reported was that there were at least sixteen of these types of letters or cards that were sent during the course of this. Uh, what I'm calling is wartime means peacetime for this bomber. Now, investigators studying the penciled, blocked, lettered messages, and they noted that the letters G and Y had a very odd shape to them. They believe that this is possibly indicating that FP had some type of European education. And I'd assume that they would actually think that this guy might have been military or, or something like that. Uh, because he is not bombing during wartime. Yeah, there was some consideration to that, that possibly he was gone during this time. I wanted to find out more specifically when the 16 threatening letters or postcards were sent and received, because if he was off at war, you know what I mean? Like, was he, were these not received for five years? The only information I could find was during this time that no bombs were sent there was still threatening letters and cards that were sent. Right. I couldn't find dates to go with those threatening uh, messages that he was sending. But it was on 19 in 1951, on March 29th, shortly after 5 p.m., a hand grenade-sized pipe bomb exploded in the landmark Grand Central Terminal at New York City. The bomb had been dropped into an ashtray, you know, one of those standing ashtrays with like the sand in it. Yeah, we, we don't really have too many of those anymore. This would have this ashtray was located near the Grand Central Oyster Bar and Restaurant on the terminal's lower level. Mm -hmm. As said, the bomb did explode. This startled passengers, but thankfully no one was killed and no one was injured. Police dismissed this event as the work of, quote, boys or pranksters. The New York Times reported the event in the following day's issue, though only with a three-paragraph brief at the bottom of page 24. Ordinarily, the detonation of a pipe bomb in a busy commuter terminal right. at rush hour would, would be cause for grave public concern, yet the local news immediately uh, and barely acknowledged this event. Well, it seemed like they're trying to brush it off because, one, nobody was hurt. And then the explosion wasn't uh, huge. It didn't cause a lot of damage. 
And I think the police stating that this is boys or pranksters really kind of quiets down the alarm there. Right. I mean, you're not going to report on the front page that a, a local deli was egged by a bunch of <laughs> high schoolers. Right. Weeks later in April, another small bomb exploded inside a phone booth. This time it was in the basement of the New York Public Library. A security guard on watch was leaning against the phone booth when it exploded. Luckily, he was somehow able to escape with his life. Uh, The explosion nearly destroyed the phone booth, but no one, including the security guard, was injured. During the investigation, the NYPD bomb squad found fragments very similar to the bomb at Grand Central. Both were short lengths of well-machined pipe with threaded with a threaded cap at each end. Inside the pipe was 25 caliber a 25 caliber shell and explosive gunpowder packed with nuts and bolts. Yeah. While police believe this could be connected to the Grand Central bomb just weeks prior, they still kind of chalk this up to some boys or pranksters. Yeah, but here's where I have an issue with that because this one, we have a phone booth and we remember what old-time phone booths look like. This phone booth was destroyed. So if somebody would have been inside the phone booth, uh, this person could be seriously hurt or or even killed. And the other fact, though, too, Captain, is these are probably, we know Grand Central's a well-traveled area. I would imagine the New York Public Library would have at most times of the day have lots of people in there. This is, these are dangerous spots to be putting these explosives. Mm -hmm. Now, police failed to make the connection to the bombs that were back from 1941. And this, you know, because there's a huge, yeah, big gap, rightfully. So it was like 10 years ago and you know, but, but however, during the 10 years when the mad bomber was inactive, remember, We said menacing letters were sent. One of those did warn that a bomb would be placed at Grand Central Station. I don't remember the exact wording, but it was a warning regarding that there would be an explosion at Grand Central. Yeah. In August of 51, the NYPD bomb squad combed through the rubble of another phone booth and found fragments of yet another pipe bomb of the now familiar design. This phone booth explosion was once again at Grand Central. In this attack, no one was killed nor injured. The police reported that they believed this to be the result of a of sheer luck rather than a you know plan of the bomber. Right. In the investigation, police noted in their report that the latest bomb showed quote considerable advancement in technique. Now, police without a public threat or letter from the bomber, the investigators had no notion of the perpetrators or the nature uh, of, of the motive behind the attack. Well, it seems like the bomber was, you know, he's kind of a DIY guy, you know, so he went down to the Home Depot and he uh, took a weekend class on how to make bombs. So he, it seems like he upped his game on this one. Yeah. And then he gets a wool sock that he no longer wants and. Puts it in the puts the bomb in the wool sock and carries it off to wherever the, the did they target find a, is. Did they find a wool sock in any of these ones? That I'm uncertain of, Captain. I know that the wool sock would be a common thing that they would find from time to time uh, regarding right. these bombs, but in these specific ones, I don't know. We have to keep in mind, though, the first time that a wool sock was found was in a contained a bomb that didn't explode. Right. These last these last ones exploded. You, yeah. you you might not find any fragments of something as flammable or easy to destroy as a wool sock. Well, and it, at this point, like you said, they're not really connecting the dots of the the two, two previous bombs, mm-hmm. and that and then also the mad bomber and all his threats. They're not connecting those dots there. But one has to wonder with these last. Well, I guess it'd be three, right? We have one at the Grand Central Station, then we have one back at the library, and then we have one back at Grand Central Station, right? So one would have to wonder, okay, are we just getting lucky here and nobody's getting hurt, or like you were saying, or is this uh, a plan from the bomber? Like, hey, I'm showing you that I can hurt people, but I'm not going to, and, and, and then what does the bomber want? 
Well, and I doing these actions. And I think, I think here with these latest bombs, what my opinion would be is the same as NYPD, where they're saying, "Look, this was just sheer luck that nobody was injured because the placement of these bombs and the fact that they did go off." They were in such a public area that you would assume the intent was to harm or kill. Right, but it seems like these bombs are also, if they go off, they're going to hurt people in a radius that's pretty small. Yeah. A couple feet where you think if this this bomber was more sophisticated or their intent was to hurt a lot of people, they're, I mean, the placement of the bombs, they're doing a good job as far as they're being able to go into a a very public place, uh, place a bomb somewhere and leave without being noticed and then, right. And then have the bomb go off. Now, if you really wanted to hurt people, um, on, on a grand level to make some kind of statement, then you would think that the bomb would be a a bigger bomb, I guess. Well, and to paint a better picture for the listeners, (laughs) I think everybody should think of a hand grenade. You know, the, the, these were very small pipe bombs, uh, almost the size of a hand grenade. And you should expect the about the same size of explosion as you would with a hand grenade. Now, keep in mind, when we see on TV and on in the movies is a dramatization of what a hand grenade explosion looks like. The super deadly thing or harmful thing here is... One of the bombs that did not explode, they said, was packed with nuts and bolts, sending these items flying through the air and potentially into people as they pass by. Yeah, I'm no John Rambo, but when I was a kid, like you would pretend that you had the grenade and you'd throw it into that 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 room, you know, and then the whole room would blow up. Mm -hmm. But but that's not the case with grenades. Oh, you've put me on the spot, Captain. I, I'm no expert in grenades, but my from my understanding with these particular bombs, right. you know, so what I think you're describing is if you threw a grenade into this garage, like if you were like uh, some some army guy and you're trying to infiltrate this, <laughs> some arm, come, um, this garage and you're worried about the threat level in this garage, you would kick in the door, mm-hmm. you would throw the grenade inside and... And assume that the grenade would blow up and kind of incinerate everybody inside this small garage that we're sitting in. And I think with that may or may not be the case. I've never thrown a grenade. I've dreamt about it many times. But these these little pipe bombs, Mm -hmm. uh, they're only about a five inch piece of of pipe, maybe six inches at the most, but often described as what one would expect to see with a grenade type explosion. Well, you think that grenade technology would advance throughout the years too. So what a grenade was capable of in the fifties is probably way different than what it's capable of now. Well, and I think the phone booth gives us a really good idea of what type of explosion to expect. Meaning that, I don't know how many phone booths do you think you could fit in this garage? And yet the, the pipe bomb only blew up that little phone booth, you know, a phone booth is considerably smaller than a room. Yeah. And anytime I hear grenades, I just think, you know, cabs are here. <laughs> well, back to the, uh, the August 51 bomb, the one that exploded at grand central station. Um, like the police said, they, they didn't really have an idea of who the perpetrator was or the motive behind the attack because there was no letter found or letter sent to describe or claim responsibility for this attack. But right. as our listeners know, with each new attack, not only do you have an increased threat level, but you also have the preponderance of evidence against the offender or at least to deduce who they are. So with each new attack... You should have one, if not both of the following, either a new clue or clues and or the same clue repeated, adding to the significance of that clue, meaning maybe you found something at a previous crime scene and let's say that item falls into the category of, well, maybe this is evidence or maybe it is not. Right. But if you have multiple crime scenes and you find a similar item, well, then this most likely has to fall into this is evidence category. 
So at some of these bomb sites, among the scattered debris of pipe fragments, shell casings, plaster, glass, nuts, and bolts, police found a partially consumed throat lozenge. Now, of course, finding a used cough drop in a public place with a lot of foot traffic may seem like just a coincidence, but all of these lozenges were in close proximity to the bombs, and they were all of the same brand. All right, we're back. Cheers, me matey. Cheers to you, Captain. There we go. Yeah. I cheers you back, but I didn't even have my beer open yet. Cheers. <laughs> you just thought that was kind of a fake. Kind, kind of limped in with that one, huh? That's when you're the designated driver, <laughs> and everybody goes cheers, and you just kind of <laughs> hold up your hand. In August of 1951, employees at the Consolidated Edison Company. They arrived at work to find that a phone booth in the lobby of their business of the main office had exploded. So this happened overnight. Now, no one was in the lobby during the explosion. So, of course, no one was hurt. The person actually in the building at the only person actually at all in the building was a security guard at nighttime. Now, for safety precautions, the building was evacuated and a thorough search was conducted. NYPD insisted that the building remain empty. This would be for several days. When they were able to return, employees in the mailroom received a suspicious package, and this was in a manila envelope, and inside, a short pipe bomb with caps on both ends. The letter was addressed to the company's personnel director. This is Edwin Jennings. Yeah, and the employees are going to evacuate the building. They're going to call in the bomb scare. The bomb squad arrived on the scene. The pipe was slowly but safely removed from the premises. Upon investigation, they discovered it was in fact a pipe bomb, and the worksmanship and the materials used both suggested it was from the serial bomber. Its triggering mechanism was based on a 25 caliber bullet, same as the earlier bombs found in 1951 around New York, and inside the pipe was a throat lozenge. Hmm. Police dusted the pipe. They dusted the envelope and the stamps for fingerprints, but found only smudges, nothing of use. Well, this also shows the time period, too, because if it was today, we'd find the throat lozenge and we'd run DNA and this would be solved. Yeah. If, if it were partially, uh, used. Right. Um, but regardless, the, the envelope could yield clues about the bomber. A postmark was from white plains, New York. A return address was from Lehman and Lehman, which was a fictionary entity. Right. An address. I used to work for him. <laughs> You were the the company president. That's how I became the captain. An address written by hand was in all caps, providing police with a handwriting sample. Then on October 22nd, the New York Herald Tribune received a letter in penciled block letters stating, Bombs will continue until Consolidated Edison Company is brought to justice for their dastardly acts against me. I have exhausted all other means. I intend with bombs to cause others to cry out for justice for me. If I don't get justice, I will continue, but with bigger bombs. All right. Dastardly deed, right? Dastardly Mm -hmm. deed. That's what you keep saying. Mm -hmm. Uh, When you hear that, what's the first thing that comes to your, your brain? Comic books. Yeah, me too. I I think uh, Batman. I feel like, this yeah, is like I was, something that like a criminal and in, in the early Batman with Adam West would say like, oh, I'm going to get you Batman for your dastardly deeds. Well, and I was going, yeah, I was going to be a little more specific with that, but I couldn't really place, you know, when I kept digging into this case and I kept hearing this over and over again, dastardly deeds, I couldn't put my finger on which one I would claim that to be from, but that seems very, it seems very 1930s in a way too. 
like mm-hmm. comic booky 1930s. I'm going to get you for the, you know, the dastardly deeds. The the letter also listed two targets, one directed police to the Paramount Theater, which is in the very busy Times Square district. There, a live bomb was discovered hidden inside of an old wool sock and left in the men's restroom. Mm. Luckily, the bomb was located in time and it was disabled. The other target was a telephone booth at Pennsylvania Station. There, nothing was found. Either either the bomber was unable to deliver on the threat or he wanted to send the police on a wild goose chase. Back to the bomber's letters. So detectives made a surprising realization. The first Grand Central device in March of 1951 was not the first. In the evidence archives of the New York City police housed in a dusty box dating from before the war, there was another note written by the same handwriting in the same strange block letters and signed FP. So detectives started working under the premise that this serial bomber may be seeking revenge. And one of the the more common threats was to consolidated Edison. So possibly an angry customer or disgruntled former employee. Yeah. Detectives teamed up with Con Ed management. That's what they call them there for short, Con Ed, and provided a sample of the bomber's handwriting, asking the company to rummage through its employee archives, seeking, you know, a problematic ex-employee with handwriting resembling the unusual letter forms or somebody with the initials FP or possibly both. Right. Right. Uh, Considering the thousands of people that the large utility company had employed over the years, reviewing these files would be quite the task. They compared the handwriting sample with old employee applications and tax forms. So this was a very tedious process. Uh, but what happened was it actually produced a single person, uh, a man who was a former employee. He, this man was once fired from consolidated Edison company for theft. And now at this time in the case, he was the prime suspect in the serial bombing case. Yeah. This man's name is Frederick Eberhard. Hmm. So he, well, we got the F part. Yeah, he was a 56-year-old cable splicer who had worked for Con Ed until they fired him in 1948. Um, What was he caught stealing? I don't know what he was caught stealing, but not only was he fired for theft, but the police had arrested Eberhardt for that crime, for the theft. Mm. It went to trial, uh, but what he was acquitted. Then Eberhardt, in turn, filed a lawsuit against Con Edison for... $75,000 $75,000 at this time which back then that would have been a lot of money. Oh, he would um, probably not have to work again. Yeah. Uh, at this time, the lawsuit that he was seeking against consolidated Edison was still unresolved, but police noted as a cable splicer, he presumably had the mechanical means to build these crude bombs. Right. And as a disgruntled employee, he had a motive and the strange block handwriting was spot on. It it matched his handwriting on Monday, November 5th, police went to Frederick Eberhard's home in Connecticut. Police accused him of sending the bombs and threatening letters and they arrested him. The interrogation process. Well, it did not bring a confession nor provide the police with any additional evidence evidence against Eberhard. Eberhard was charged with sending threatening materials through the mail. Now the following Wednesday, a disheveled Eberhard stood handcuffed in court as the state district attorney explained to the judge and quote, this defendant is a particular source of annoyance to the New York city police. We are firmly convinced that he is not of sound mind. He has been sending simulated bombs around the city the past few months. Hundreds of police have been called out at all hours of the day and night to investigate 
because of his actions. The judge ruled that Eberhard be sent to the psychiatric portion of Bellevue Hospital for evaluation. Eberhard's wife, Louise, insisted that the police had the wrong man. Several months later, the case was actually dismissed in court after Eberhard's lawyer argued successfully that the package that they actually arrested him for, the, the latest package, right. uh, it was not... So he's being charged with sending threatening items through the mail. Yeah. The problem with that charge is the bomb doesn't explode. It was actually, I believe, deemed that it could not physically explode. So there is no threat with the actual bomb. And furthermore, in that particular incident, there was no threatening note sent along with the bomb or later claiming responsibility. So therefore, uh, the the arrest charge of sending threatening materials through the mail, well, there was nothing actually threatening about it deemed by this judge. The, the lawyer argued that successfully. So this this guy is charged with it, but then it's ultimately just dismissed and thrown out of court. On November 28th, a bomb went off at the 14th Street subway station. The serial bomber had rented a coin-operated locker at the IRT 14th Street subway station. There, the bomber placed one of his small signature pipe bombs. The bomb exploded, destroying several lockers and adding much damage to the immediate area. No one was injured. Now, if this latest bomb didn't indicate to NYPD that they had the wrong man when they arrested Eberhard, well, then a note sent at the end of 1951 certainly would. And this note read, Have you noticed the bombs in your city? If you are worried, I am sorry. And also, if anyone is injured. But it cannot be helped, for justice will be served. I am not well. And for this, I will make the Con Edison sorry. Yes, they will regret their dastardly deeds. I will bring them before the bar of justice. Public opinion will condemn them. For beware, I will place more units under theater seats in the near future. Signed, FP. So even though there's not, there's not these huge explosions and a lot of people being injured, this is costing the city a lot of money. Yeah, and the thing we have to understand here is, much like today, the bomb squad is a very specific unit. And even though, even in a city as large as New York, keep in mind this is the, most of these bombs were in 1951. And so these men are getting called out at all hours of the night. There's not like, it's not like you constantly have a whole team of, of bomb squad. They were actually called bomb squad detectives back then right. uh, on duty 24 seven around the clock. And if you, if anybody reads up on this case or, or looks on the internet into this case, there's some fascinating pictures of the technology at the time. The the way that they removed these bombs with toothpicks. Well, it's it's actually very strange looking. It looks like from the black and white pictures, it almost looks like the bomb squad detectives are wearing um, almost like a, a a wicker material or some kind of basket over their head. When really, it's a. Uh, have right. you seen these? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and and actually, the bomb squad vehicle that they removed the bomb in also looks like it's this giant basket when really what it is, is it's threaded steel, I believe, or some type of metal. So they're actually wearing, it's like man in the iron mask. Picture that they're wearing like a helmet, this metal helmet that almost looks somewhat like a basket. It's got tiny little slits for the eyes so that they can get close to these bombs and either defuse them or remove them. And they also wear these vests and these are like, I'm guessing they're like iron clad type vests so that if it were to go off that those items like the nuts and bolts that we talked about inside the right. pipe, that when they explode, that they would, they would be either caught or unable to penetrate and bounce off of this metal vest that they wear. And I could only imagine captain the weight, the weight of that, that kind of steel helmet basically in that steel or, 
ironclad vest that they're wearing. Often what you would see these detectives do is they would get close and they would approach this bomb. You have to, can you imagine the amount of bravery it would take for an individual to get, to walk right up to a bomb, especially after we've had some go off and they're starting to look the same. You're, you've gotten to a point now in 1951 that you've had about a dozen bombs and about half of them have gone off. And so now you know that the threat level is certainly there and to have the bravery to approach this thing and pick it up and remove it. Cause most of the time they've removed it. They, it's not like, right. It's not like mission impossible where you see Tom Cruise zip line in and, and take the thing apart and decide which wire to cut. It's these two detectives picking physically, picking up this bomb, disrupting it, sitting there, which could in fact make it go off in your hand. They would place it in some type of bag purse or, or basket type thing. Mm-hmm. And they would place this thing in the center of a bar, like a long bar so that you could put one, you could hoist one, end of the bar up over your shoulder and I could hoist one up over my shoulder and we could walk it out of there to the vehicle, to that ironclad vehicle to remove this thing from the area, keeping everyone else safe, but in turn, putting ourselves very much in harm's way. The purpose of the bar that we place the thing on the bar is so at the very least, if this thing goes off, if this bomb explodes while we are transporting it to the vehicle, at least you and I are two and a half, three and a half feet from the thing when it, when it explodes. Well, and you get this jack wagon that is sending bombs so often now that you, now you have to put yourself in this situation over and over again. And then some of these bombs aren't going off. So you wonder if that, like, you know, you're in a job that you shouldn't ever let your guard down, Mm -hmm. but this, you know, jack wagon is, you know, uh, putting out bombs that aren't blowing up. So then, uh, yeah, it'd be a whole mental um, game that wouldn't be fun in that job. Well, so roughly here, Captain, we have about a 10 year uh, or more time span. And through that course of time, we have at least uh, 16 to 20 threatening letters that are sent out and received. But we also have about a dozen bombs over the course of that time, right. probably about half of them going off, actually exploding. The, the strange mental thing here is that we have in that letter at the end of 1951 that is sent, it says if anyone was injured, he's apologizing. The the bomber is apologizing should anyone be injured or if anyone is worried. I think that's a little telling about what we might be dealing with here and as to whom might be sending these bombs. It doesn't help you zero in on anyone, but it puts you in their mindset in a sense that, we have half the bombs didn't go off. One wasn't even lit because he was probably scared when he got spotted by police or somebody caught on to what he was doing and the bomb was dropped without even being lit. Right. Now, some of the the bombs that did go off, think about where those ones were placed. Most of them were inside a phone booth and the one was inside of a, a trash can or um ashtray that's kind of shaped like a trash can. Right, right. But the thing, my thought there that I immediately go to is even though you're creating this thing that's supposed to harm and hurt people to get your, your revenge message across about these con Edison dastardly deeds, you're not really trying to hurt anybody. You're almost containing your own bomb. Aren't you by putting it in a phone booth to, to, to the extent that maybe it only, it it only hurts the person that went into the phone booth. Well, right. And the contradicting part though of that is he's also putting bombs and, very heavily trafficked areas and very popular areas. And I think maybe with like the train station, not so much of the library, but especially with the train station and theaters and stuff like that, maybe it's some idea that also that we have uh, travelers, people coming in from the area. Maybe that if there, we have bombs going off that the police are going to take this a little more serious. Mm -hmm. Um, But so it's, it's very weird because it like contradicts it's, you know, he almost contradicts himself like, well, I'm going to put this bomb in a heavily trafficked area, but I'm going to place it in such a way that it possibly won't hurt anybody. Well, to give, to paint a better picture of what these bombs are. Okay. So these bombs were all filled with gunpowder. They were pipe bombs filled with gunpowder. They ranged in size from 
four to 10 inches in length to half an inch to two inches in diameter. Now, most of these bombs that used timers were constructed from flashlight batteries or cheap pocket watches. And we know on at least one occasion that a wool sock was used to transport the bomb. The other thing here too, Captain, that you pointed out earlier was that in 1951, when the Mad Bomber reappeared, you know, he said, I'm going to take off this time due to the war. When he reappeared, the long hiatus since the last bomb, this, and mind you, at the same time, they've discovered that the, the construction techniques of the new bombs found in 1951 had improved. Right. So, well, obviously, I mean, there was time, there was a time gap. Yeah. Right. So you'd think that like it, it would improve, like, I mean, wouldn't you just assume it would, it, it would improve on some level technology and materials that they could use? Well, I mean, we're talking about, we're talking about 10 years, not a great length of time. What I, I mean by that could be a lot, that's quite a bit of time as far as like no, technology but is concerned. What, what, no, but I'm going off of what investigators are concerned with. Right, right. Investigators are specifically saying not the materials used. They're talking about the long hiatus since the last bomb, plus the improved construction techniques right. of the bomb is what led investigators to believe that the bomber had served in the military. you want to take our new show off the record for a test drive do what just just what the captain said go to stitcherpremium.com slash true crime garage and use the promo code garage and you'll get a free month of listening all right we'll see you back in the garage tomorrow until then be good be kind and don't litter